Man, that Josh guy. That's really weird, you know? I know. I know. I know.
are family together. And there is great blessing and joy when the body of Christ can be together. So, Lord, thank you for our time. Thank you for each person that's here, each person that's joining us online. May you move and work in our hearts today, I pray, and I'll say something to you. Amen. You may be seated. Let me just call your attention this morning as we begin with just a few announcements. First of which, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for your incredible generosity last week with the Christian covered offering grants that somewhere in the $700 range, correct? Was our offering total, which is an incredible offering. Uh, what a great need exists here in our community. Uh, I met with uh, another Church of God pastor this past week in a meeting, and he pastors over in Akron and uh, works with the food bank there, and they give out thousands of pounds of food every month to people who are in need. And so what a wonderful opportunity we have here locally to help uh, meet the needs here in our community. So thank you for your generosity there. Just a couple other announcements I'd to call your attention to. Don't forget that this coming Wednesday is the question and answer informational meeting ahead of the annual business meeting. That meeting will be here in this room at 6.30 p.m. I will live stream that meeting through Zoom, so if you can't be out and like to participate, you're welcome to connect there. You'll be able to see me, hear me, I'll articulate for you watching on Zoom any questions that get asked in the room, but if you're watching on Zoom, you'll also be able to ask questions as well. And it's a great time for you to ask questions about general ministry things, about the budget, about the staffing proposal that was on our ballot for this year. And so please be sure to be a part of that. And then next Sunday, immediately following worship, start around 12 o'clock, we will have our annual business meeting. My hope is that we can conduct our business in about an hour's time. I just want to remind you again in a very loving sense how important it is that we have four, which is 25 people. So please, if, if at all possible, I encourage you to be here in the room. And folks that are watching this online, if you can be present for our meeting next week, surely one of you can be here and be a part of that so that we can conduct our official business. Last announcement I have for you is for Raven Pack. I know a number of you have asked me through the beginning of this month, well, what is our next item? Our next item will go to our pack at the end of February, and it's the snack size bags of goldfish crackers. And it could be goldfish crackers, it could be the rainbow crackers, it could be the goldfish pretzels, it matters not. We're just donating snack size bags of that goldfish product. So I just want to encourage you to do that. That pack will take place about the last weekend of February, so we have almost an entire month to do our collection uh, of those things. Once again, I'm just going to invite you to stand with me as we continue our time together in worship. Today's focus is all about the, the body of Christ, about being together. So much of what we're going to be singing today, much of what we share in music is all about we, not about me. And so as we sing today, may you just remember that we are a part of the body of Christ, the family of God.
some tough times and we uh, sometimes ask ourselves what's going on, but we know that you are in control because you created all of this world, Lord, that we have. Lord, we ask for wisdom and understanding to endure these times, Lord, and we know that we can depend on you. We're so thankful for the joy that you bring despite what we are going through. Father, we just ask that we may be used to share this to a dying world, Lord. To a world we know all around us are hurting and confused. And may we bring this word that we have with us, Lord, to to bring peace to someone in need, Lord. Lord, as we go about this day, we ask for your anointing on our pastor, Lord, as he speaks to us through your word, Lord. And not just on him, but on all those who are present here, Lord, that our ears may be anointed and open to hear your word, Lord. Lord, as we patiently wait for your return, may we be willing to give of ourselves to share with one another in, in this world. And we ask your blessing on this day. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Again, it's good to see you this morning. Thanks, folks, who are joining us online. I know Mandy's there to monitor the chat for you today. I'm sure you've already greeted one another. But it's good to be together. It's always good to see you each week. Grateful always for our time together. We are now in week three of this series called Grow. It's a series that I've been trying to focus on what it means to go deeper in our walk of faith with Jesus. We're going to continue that today, and we'll wrap that series up next week. Some of you are old enough in this room to remember, but it's been quite a number of years ago, that Tom Hanks did a movie entitled Castaway. If you don't know anything about that movie, Hanks is a guy who works for uh, the airline shipping industry, and he's riding along on a plane that ends up going down. He is left stranded alone on a deserted island. And the story chronicles his journey of being there alone and eventually building a raft, and he then escapes the safety. But as a part of
part of his time there, Hanks is, of course, alone, and he doesn't like being alone, and so he searches through the wreckage that has washed ashore, and lo and behold, he finds a volleyball manufactured by the Wilson Company, and he is able to paint a face on that volleyball, and he refers to it as Wilson. And throughout his long journey there, he converses regularly with Wilson. Even when he begins to make his escape on the raft, he takes Will Wilson with him, and there comes this kind of climactic moment when the storm rises up and Wilson is washed away from the raft. And Hanks doesn't know how he's going to go on because he no longer has companions. I call that movie to your attention to let you know or to remind you that you and I are social beings. We are not meant to live alone. Being connected socially in meaningful ways is actually key to our health and our human survival. It's not just a cool thing to do in a movie to compel a story. It's actually something that applies to each one of us. Social connection in meaningful ways is key to your health and my health, key to our survival. Well, you are quite aware that one of the negative impacts of COVID has been disconnection and isolation. So this past week, I was doing some research for this message, and I began to do some reading of some scholarly items, or articles from the mental health community. And in some of the early statistics that they are seeing, here's what I can tell you has happened. Preliminary surveys suggest that in the first few months of COVID, loneliness increased 20 to 30 percent. Emotional distress tripled. And those numbers have continued to go up. Anxiety is at an all-time high. Things like alcoholism and drug abuse. Pornography become poor substitutes for people that are unable to be together. We can't see each other clearly because we're looking through screens. We can't see each other's faces. That's why I encourage you just to drop for a moment that mask today so that you can see the smile of someone else. We can't hug. We can't shake hands. We can't go to the hospital and visit. We can't be with our loved ones when they are in the hospital. It has changed how we connect with one another or fail to connect with one another at funerals and weddings. So the struggle to balance literal survival with all the things that make our surviving worthwhile has never been clearer. It has forced many of us to sacrifice those social connections and therefore the quality of life, which includes our growth as human beings. But this disconnect, this isolation also has impacted us spiritually as believers. Some of that disconnect and isolation has happened because it's been mandated for us, highly recommended by health and science people. Some of that disconnection and isolation has happened by choice. Now, there are many times good reasons for making those choices. Sometimes, though, over time, we just allow that choice to be easier and easier, and we use as an excuse to remain isolated and disconnected. But the truth is this. If you and I are going to experience spiritual health, we must stay connected. If we're going to see spiritual growth both personally and corporately, then you and I must be connected as the body of Christ. So up till now in this series, I've been talking about your personal growth, your own spiritual journey, and how do you grow in your faith? How do you deepen your walk with Jesus? But today I'm going to focus very specifically on our growth as the body of Christ. Why should church matter to you, to me? And why do you matter to the church? It's a question that we must wrestle with today. We're going to look into God's Word and it's in the book of Ephesians. So if you have a Bible, folks online, if you're joining with me, you want to take a Bible and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 4, towards the end of the New Testament. I said this on Wednesday night as part of Bible study. I said it a week ago when we were in Galatians. These are short verses or books. It's easy to kind of skip past them. Book of Ephesians, chapter 4. 
I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. This is what Paul says to the church. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, and to do it with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us grace has been given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says he ascended on high and he led captives, a host of captives. And he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? And he who descended is himself, also he who ascended far above the heavens, so that he might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, for the building up of the body of Christ. And so we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, as a result, we're no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness of deceitful schemes. But speaking the truth of love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body to be building up itself in love. God, would you take your word and apply it to our hearts today? God, perhaps this is a passage of scripture that we have heard many times before in our faith journey. And it would be easy in our flesh to say, well, I already gleaned every bit of truth from that text that I need to glean. Father, forgive us when we have put up those kinds of barriers. And I just echo the prayer of my brother from earlier. Lord, would you enlighten our ears, ears today to hear. Would you give us the courage today to be obedient to whatever it is that your spirit speaks to us? I pray this in your name. As I begin today, I want to just remind you of the language of growth. You see the language of growth all throughout scriptures, especially in the New Testament. Human beings, most science says that for the average human being, male and female, that by the age of 25, you and I stop all of the physical growth that we will experience in our earthly life by 25. That may be true for your human body, but the life of faith should be a life of growth. The life of faith should be a life of growth. There is never a time in your spiritual journey where you have an out, where you are no longer asked to grow in your faith. It is a part of who you are. It's a part of the call that God has for us as his followers. It's the heartbeat behind this series, that we would come to understand in a better way, a deeper way, that we are called to a lifetime of growing in our faith. It's a part of what I believe God has given me in a vision for us for this year. Kind of a two-pronged approach. We're to grow deeper in our faith, but then we're to go wider with the gospel. It's a part of our growing and growing and growing as followers of Jesus. But we also see that in the text. Look at verse 12. The language of grow is present. He says that all these things have been given for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, for the building up of the body. That word equipping and building up means to completely furnish, to perfect. In fact, as Paul says here in the text, one of my chief assignments as a pastor is to work to help build you up for the things of the kingdom. Growth is part of the language that Paul uses. He says in verse 13 that we're to come to this place of being a mature man. We're called to mature more and more into Christ's likeness. The word mature means to be full grown or to be finished. And while we will never be fully grown this side of heaven, we will never be finished this side of heaven, 
The call is for us to continue the movement towards that place. We're to continue to grow. Verse 14, Paul says that we're no longer to be children. And in the text there, what that word means is someone who is unskilled or untaught. And what Paul is saying is that you may be in that place now, but you're going to be moving to a place where you're no longer unskilled. You're no longer untrained in the faith. You're to be growing. Verse 15 says to grow into all aspects into him. And in verse 16, he refers to the growth of the body. The language of growth is all over this text. Why? Because the life of faith is a life of growth. So here's the engagement questions. Cole, I'm skipping over the one quote that I have. Here's a question that I need to ask you, and you should ask yourself, and we should ask one another. Since we last met together, have you grown in your faith? Have you grown in your faith since you and I last met together? Whether that was from Sunday to Sunday or even from Wednesday night to now. Or some of you I've seen you on Wednesday night. Have you grown in your faith? And if you're not sure, then that's perhaps something that you need to go before the Father and say, God, show me where I need to grow. So now, as opposed to talking about growing in a personal sense, let's talk about growing when it pertains to the body of Christ. The body. You have heard me say it many times before, that the predominant metaphor, the predominant image that is used in the New Testament, and even really throughout all of Scripture, this metaphor for the faith is a corporate one. You hear words like the building, the household, or the family of God, and that's in part why we say I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God today. It's a corporate metaphor. It's the nation. It's the flock. He doesn't just refer to individual sheep. He talks about, I have sheep from other places. They're going to come together. There's going to be one flock and one shepherd. It is a corporate metaphor. Here, Paul actually uses this physical metaphor of our bodies. And he uses anatomical imagery. He uses words like stature or height. He talks about head and joints and sinew and muscle kinds of things. He also uses additional corporate language in this text. If you look at verse 1, it says, Therefore I, prisoner of the Lord, implore you. You're going to say, well, Pastor God, that's singular. In fact, you. It's talking about me and this one. No. It's the, the, the failure of it or the incompleteness of our English language. For that word in the original text, you, is actually in the plural form. Paul were a southerner, he would say, I implore you all. Because he means all of us together, not individually. He uses words like we in verse 13 and in verse 16. It's the corporate nature. Paul is addressing this letter not to just individual believers, but to the church. We are called to grow as the body. So, here's another question for us to wrestle with today. Which are you more mindful of? Are you more mindful of personal spiritual growth? Or are you more mindful of corporate spiritual growth? Which are you more mindful of? I want us to become more and more mindful of the importance of corporate growth. Because, you see, we need not only you, but we need you plus we. We need both. I want us to be mindful of both because there is a connection between your personal growth, my personal growth, and our personal growth. Your spiritual health matters to me because your spiritual health matters to we. And my spiritual health should not only matter to you individually, but my spiritual health also should matter to we. Why? Because God has created us to be a family, a body, a household together. We are not unlike our human bodies. It's a great illustration for us. Think of your human body and think of the systems of your human body. Things like your respiratory system. Think about your circulatory system. Think about your nervous system. What happens when any one of those things are alive? It impacts the whole body. 
If I have arterial artery disease and my arteries begin to become clogged, I'm going to start to see that in other places. I'm going to start having shortness of breath. Now it will impact my respiratory system. It may start causing memory issues because I'm not getting the blood flow to my brain that I need to have. Worst case scenario, those arteries become so blocked that the entire body, not just the circulatory system, but the entire body dies. So it is with the body of Christ. When one member is not where they need to be in their faith, it eventually will have an impact on the corporate nature of the body of Christ. It will throw off the whole. Paul talks about that, going back to our text. Look at verses 15 and 16. Because Paul is going to tell us that every part is needed for the body to grow and mature, for the body to be healthy. Verse 15. Speaking the truth in love, or to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working. The proper working means that we need to be healthy individually. According to the proper working of each individual part, it will cause the body to grow and build itself up. In love. You and I are in this together. It's been one of the hashtag slogans of this pandemic journey for us as a country and as a world, that we're in this together. But that's not something that came about just because of the pandemic. It's truth for us as the body of Christ. You and I are in this faith journey together. And we should not forget that. It's why community is one of our core values here at the church. And while it may be a measure of aspirational, meaning that we have not yet quite achieved what we need to, community is something that we value here. Why? Because we are in this faith journey together. There was an old song many years ago that the leader talked about just Jesus and me. Uh, how many of you remember that song, Just Jesus and Me? I want to tell you today that the underlying tone of that statement is completely unbiblical. Because just Jesus and me will only lead to a stunted and truncated faith. It is just you and Jesus. Why? Because he has created us to be together as the body of Christ. Every believer, every believer should be plugged into a local church. What the word, what the word says. Every believer should be plugged into a local church. Now, by plug in, I do not mean simply somebody who comes and sits in the field. Because, again, that will not lead to the full growth and maturity of the body. Every believer needs to be plugged into a church to be present in whatever way that it is possible to be present and to be engaged in the life of the church, engaged in ministering to one another in community, engaged by ministering to one another through the gifts that God has given you. And when we do not do that, church, we are not near as healthy as we could be or should be. I'm not trying to belittle anybody who's watching online, but I dare say that there's at least someone who is watching online today who has allowed the pandemic to become the excuse for being isolated and separated from the body of Christ. And I want to challenge our online viewers as God would speak to you through his spirit. To return and be present. Now I know that's not always possible, but there are ways that we can be present with other members of the body of Christ. And I'm going to talk about one of those at the close of the service today. We cannot journey in the faith alone and expect to stay healthy and strong. So the question that I have for us today: where and how are you connecting for growth? Where and how are you connecting? Not just one-on-one, -on -one, but how are you connecting corporately to grow in your faith? Because it matters to you and it matters to me. How are you connecting? Well, if we are going to grow together as a body of Christ, what are some of the evidence? Our growth, what is the evidence of growth for the community of faith? Our text gives us three very clear areas where we can grow. It's not a sum total, it's not the only places, but in this text, three key evidences of our growth. The first is this, that unity is pursued, and I know that Danny was talking about unity today in his Sunday school class. 
If a body of believers is growing in their faith, they will be pursuing unity together. And by unity, I do not mean uniformity. It doesn't mean that we all have to dress the same. It doesn't mean that we all have to talk the same or think exactly the same. We're not unified in that way. We're unified in a different way. And Paul gives us some marvelous pictures of that. Look with me at verses 4 through 6. Actually, let's go to verse 3. He says, talk about being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body, one Spirit. You were called in one hope. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. We need to pursue unity around the core of our faith, which is God himself and his call to us in Jesus Christ, his redemptive Word. There's an awful lot of conversation that goes on out in the public sphere that says, well, the God of the Jews and the God of the Muslims and the God of the Christians is all the same. We do not unite together because that is not true. They worship a God who seems to carry many similarities to the God that we serve, but it is not the same God. The God of the Mormons is not the same God that we worship because they do not believe what we hold to be true about God and His Son, Jesus Christ. But we as a church need to unite around those things. And how is that unity possible? It happens as verse 3 says, it is through the Spirit that we have this bond of peace. It is through the Spirit that we have unity. When I shared with you last week from Galatians chapter 5 about life in the flesh versus life in the Spirit, the only way that you and I as the body of Christ are going to experience unity together is if the Spirit is transforming us individually and corporately. This issue of unity is a key tenet of our Church of God movement. If you don't know much of our history, one of the earliest books written by one of our founders is entitled The Quest for Unity and Holiness. He believed that believers were called to be united together through the saving, redeeming work of Jesus Christ, and that holiness should mark the life of the church together. That holiness only comes through the work of the Spirit in your life. This unity is seen because the body and the flesh, your body and mind, our systems do not have competing agendas, but they instead work together. I mean, my circulatory system is not in competition with my muscles or with my respiratory system or my nervous system. They all work in concert to make my body do what God intended for it to do. And Paul says it should be the same in the body of Christ. Verses 15 and 16, we've already talked about it, but let me just point out some specific words. In verse 16, he talks about the body being fitted and held together. The language that Paul uses is the root word where we get our modern word of synergy. We talk about synergy, which is many parts coming together to work towards a positive outcome. That is what Paul is talking about. When you and I, as the body of Christ, work together in unity, there is a synergy. There is an energy that comes. We don't work in competition. We work in concert. Why is this important? Well, I just want to share with you some words from A.W. Tozer. It's a powerful statement that he makes. He says this, Unity is necessary to the outpouring of the Spirit of God. If you have 120 volts of electricity coming into your house, but you have broken wiring, you may flip on the switch, but nothing works. No lights will come on, the stove will warm, the radio doesn't turn on. Why? Because you have broken wiring. The power is ready to do the work, but where there is broken wiring, there is no power. Unity is necessary among the children of God if we're going to know the flow of power to see God do his wonders. Could it be that the reason that the world does not see more of the working of God through his son Jesus Christ in the world in general, because the church has failed on this point of unity? Could it be? Could it be, and I'm shouldering in part the way of this, could it be that this church has not always seen the work that God wants to do in and through us because we have not been near as united as we might think we are? Just asking the question, I'm not accusing, 
I am just merely asking the question. One more question. Unity matters. So here's a question then for us to wrestle with. Do you and I, do we together work to pursue unity? Do we work intentionally to pursue unity? But not only unity is an evidence of our growth, there's a second evidence of our growth, and that is that we celebrate diversity. It's the flip side of that same coin. Diversity is celebrated. Unity is pursued, but diversity is celebrated. The church is the body of Christ, and the text tells us that. Christ is the head. Scriptures tell us that it is Christ, God through Christ, who draws people into relationship with them. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18, Paul tells us that it is God himself who places people in the body as he sees fit. God himself places people in the body as he sees fit. So, if God has placed them, we should celebrate them. If God has placed them, we should celebrate them. Every woman, regardless of age or gender, is a part of the body of Christ. Every person in this room, folks watching online, regardless of your age or your gender, you as a believer are a part of the body of Christ, and we need to celebrate that. We need to celebrate that. Part of celebrating that diversity is that intergenerationality should be a mark of the church, not just multi-generational. What's the difference between the two? You can have a multi-generational church, and every one of those different generations can exist in their own little silo, isolated away all by themselves. But if you are intergenerational, those silo walls come down and you become interwoven, intimately connected to one another. We are a family of God. That's why we value the next generation here in this church. We say that we embrace them and value them. Why? Because we need to celebrate diversity. Diversity expands our perspective. I want you to repeat the following two phrases after me. Here's the first phrase. I can't do everything. I can't do everything. Okay, second phrase is I can't know everything. I can't know everything. All right, turn to one another here and repeat those two phrases to each other. I can't know everything. I can't do everything. Say that to each other. Okay? You need to say that to each other. By saying it, you are acknowledging that diversity matters. You and I are never going to be the smartest people on everything. We are never going to be the, the, the most skilled the strongest, whatever words you want to put, we will never be perfect at everything. It's been quite a, a number of years ago, but in Wendy's spiritual journey, and so I'm sorry, Wendy, I didn't ask you about giving this illustration at the time. But Wendy, in trying to wrestle with this very thing, talked about the Wonder Woman issue. The Wonder Woman issue, the image, and having this, even a, 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 an action figure of Wonder Woman and, and putting Wonder Woman to bed, put her in the grave to bury her because Wendy could not be wonderful. You and I are not Superman. We are not wonderful. We cannot do all of those things. We need each other. And Paul says very, very clearly that it is this diversity that is the only path to spiritual maturity. God, in verses 11 and 12, says that he has given different gifts so that the body can be built up. If we only needed one of those gifts, we would have stopped at one. Why does he give different gifts? Because we need diversity. Those gifts are different in how they are exercised. Verse 16 says that you and I, as the body of Christ, depend on what every joint supplies. That means for you and I, we must discover our spiritual gifts and we must exercise them in the life of the body. It's not only important for our individual growth, but it is vitally important for the growth of the body. Do you know your gifts? Are you using them? Here's the question we must wrestle with. It's like the question about unity. Do you and do we celebrate diversity? 
do you and do we celebrate the first one? Here's the last of the three evidences that Paul gives in our text. And that is this, that love is exercise. Love is exercise. Go to the beginning of our text today. Paul talks about being a prisoner of the Lord, and he implored them to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which they have been called. And then verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. One of the most obvious places that this can play itself out in the life of the church, I have seen it time and time again, sadly over my years of ministry. This lack of love being exercised plays itself out between generations. Older generations look at younger generations with disdain rather than love. Younger generations look at older generations with great frustration, great disconnect because they don't see love being exercised. And it is a two-way street. Love must be demonstrated, not just tolerated, not just coexisting together, but we are called as the body of Christ to engage across the generational line. And the only way the church is added to be possible is if you and I exercise the love of Jesus. Verse 15, Paul tells the church they are to speak the truth in love. That text could be understood in this way, be sincere in love. Could be understood as to follow the truth in love, to hold to or to profess the truth, the fundamental doctrines together in love. Rather than saying, well, you don't disagree with me, or you don't agree with me, so I'm going to now be nasty to you. No, we need to love one another. Paul says that the body works together in verse 16. Why? For what purpose? To be built up in love. Love needs to be exercised in the body of Christ. If you would go back to the book of Corinthians on your own and look at verse or chapter 12, you're going to find a passage of scripture that is very similar to the text we read today. Paul's talking about the differing gifts in the body of Christ and the purpose for all of those gifts. Well, if you know your scriptures well enough, we go from verse, or chapter 12, a book all about the body of Christ working together, to chapter 13, all about love. In fact, the closing words of chapter 12 say, but I want you to pursue the more excellent way. And what is the more excellent way? The way love. Above all, put on love, Paul says elsewhere. So Paul's going to put a slide on the screen. Here's going to be one of those rare occasions where I ask you to do this. You who have smartphones. I'm going to invite you to take them out right now. Go ahead, do that. Get your phones out. This is what I want you to do. I want you to snap a picture of what you see on the wall. And if you don't have a smartphone or you just like to write, then take time and write it all down. But snap a picture of what you see on the wall. Why? This is just a sampling of one of the statements that are found in the New Testament. What are we called to do as the body of Christ? How are we called to relate to one another? Romans 12.10 implores the church to be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Else, or in the second half of verse 10, he says to give preference to one another in honor. Galatians 5.13 calls the church to serve one another. Galatians 6.2 to bear one another's burdens. Ephesians 4.32, same chapter we're in now, be kind to one another and forgive one another. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 encourage one another. Hebrews 10, 24, spur one another on to love and good deeds. James 5, 21, confess your sins one to another. It's just a sample of how we're called in love to care for each other as part of the body of Christ. Why? Because as Paul says in Corinthians 12, when one member hurts, all hurts. When one member rejoices, we're all called to rejoice. This is the life together in the body, and love should mark everything we do. So your last question today to wrestle with, do you, do we practice love in all that we do in the life of the body? Do you and I practice love in all that we do in the life of the body? 
One of the ways this plays out is if we truly love one another, then we will be intentional about connecting with one another. If you have to still have your phone out, you may know people who are not able to be out physically in the building. But you have a phone in your hand. Can you not in love pick up that phone and die and connect with them? Can you not write a note of encouragement, expressing appreciation for someone? Are you intentional about expressing that love, living that love out? Why? Because we matters. We matters. So as I wrap up today, just some action steps. I'm going to be repeating some that I've already given to you in the course of this series. Are you growing spiritually? Are you growing spiritually, personally? Are you using that through the Bible in the year challenge? And I know a number of you are. I just want to say thank you to the number of people who have expressed to me how much God has been teaching them. I have sat with some of them just this week again in my office. They were asking me questions about the readings from this past week and wrestling with it and wanting to learn more and come to understand more. Thank you for doing that. Are you growing personally? From last week, are you walking in step with the Spirit? Are you being led by the Spirit? Maybe you endeavor to fast, to seek God and to grow deeper in faith. That's a you question, but here's the we question. Are you connecting with other people in the body of Christ? Who did you share with last week? I asked you that question at the end of service. To go to somebody and tell them that you heard God speak to you that day. And ask them to pray for you that you be obedient to what God has spoken to you last Sunday. So my question to you today, who did you share with last week? I want to share with you, and I'll be doing it more in the days ahead, but I want to see us launch groups that are called connect groups that will connect with one another through the week. To build each other up in the faith, to pray with one another, to actually be together because it's so important. If you'd like to be a part of that, we'll know what that looks like. See me after service today. Do you know your spiritual gifts? Are you finding places to serve? You've never done a spiritual gifts inventory. You'd like to explore that with me? See me after service. I'd love to help you find a place where you can serve in meaningful ways. Today, will you make a commitment to pursue unity? Will you make a commitment to diversity and to celebrate it, to practicing love in the body of Christ? And then here's the final action step for you. It's why I have to take a picture of the screen. Will you choose one of those one other statements and find a way to practice it this week in the body of Christ? Choose one of those statements that you took a picture of or you wrote down and find a way to practice it this week in the body of Christ. Who do you need to serve? Who do you need to give preference to? Who do you need to express brotherly love to? Who do you need to forgive, to be kind to, to encourage, to spur them on to love and good deeds? Who do you need to confess sin to? And you can find many other one another statements in the scriptures that you can apply. But will you take one of those and put it into practice to find the Christ? Because grow is not just a personal thing. Grow is a corporate thing. Father, would you just take today the word from Paul, the words that you have given me to share, and Father, would you challenge us not only individually, but would you challenge us as the church? Lord, we are living in an incredibly turbulent time. And there are many who have professed to be the church. And their actions have not been very Christ -like. And there are many who are now skeptical of the body of Christ. God, would you help us to answer the call to grow in our faith as you intend for us to grow? So that the evidence of that growth would speak in a completely different way than so much of what we have seen in the media in recent days. Lord, may we be united together through the power of your Spirit so your power would flow to us, through us and to us. May we celebrate the diversity that is the body of Christ, rejoicing in whom you have placed here in this fellowship. And Lord, may in all things love mark us in our thoughts, in our speech, 
in our actions. God sent us forth from this place today, committed, not just individually, but committed as the body of Christ in these things. Ask these things, God, in your name. One last announcement that I failed to make to you. If you would like to have some information about the position that we have on the ballot, I've asked Athena Edwards to put together a single page ministry journey page uh, uh, to get some description about her call to ministry, uh, about her uh, desire to serve in this position. And if you'd like to have that information, we'll see if you'll see me back at the office today before you leave. We have to put one of those in your hands. Go with the grace and the mercy and the peace of Jesus. Hey, Pastor Brian. Mm -hmm.